Another kind of speciation event could happen within the same population without necessarily having a physical barrier or physical separation between the organisms. Now you may ask yourself how could that possibly happen if gene flow can continue between the species? Well, there's got to be some other sort of reproductive barrier including something like mechanical or behavioral or temporal or even gametic isolation or to separate the species. Normally this will happen when the species will explore a different niche or, or have some sort of genetic difference that occurs because of chromosomal uh, mutations and things like that. And we're going to explore some of the ways that this can happen in this video. So let's talk about that. One of the classic ways in this which this will happen, it will happen in plant evolution. And we talk about this when we talk about sexual reproduction back in the cell division lecture series. But notice how this type of strawberry that you see here on the right seems completely different from the wild strawberry that you see in nature. How is that this change actually took place? In fact, you've probably never seen one of these wild strawberries. You've probably only seen this one on the right. Well, I'll tell you right now that this strawberry that you see there is not going to be the same species as that original strawberry because it's got what we call polyploidy. Notice here it's karyotype of such an organism that has multiple copies of every single chromosome in the genome. In other words, instead of having only uh, through two of copies are being diploid and they have three copies of each chromosome type. Some strawberries that you find in the market will have as many as eight copies of chrom each chromosome. So that means it's an octoploid organism. So this is uh, sometimes how plants will undergo evolution. They will do something that's called fusion and end up creating new organisms that have multiple copies of each set of chromosome and that will lead to differentiation between the species because this strawberry on the left side will make gametes which are N. This strawberry on the right side might make gametes which are 4N. So when these two gametes try to meet, they cannot make viable offspring because they will make a 5N gamete which can't then split into half, right? You can't half this because uh, it's, it's like an odd number. So these two will no longer be able to have offspring because they're, even if they do make the offspring, this offspring will not be able to have offspring because it can't really make viable gametes. Or if it does, it, they won't be half and half. It will be a strange number of chromosomes. And that's actually causing them to be unable to cross with each other. Just like humans and chimps or humans and gorillas can't really have offspring because there's too much differences in the genome between the two species. And that will lead to... Uh, variation on the formation of the gamete and their aneuploidy will take place if you try to actually combine the gametes of the two of them. And that's why they're considered different species. So you see this could happen within a population if there's some sort of event that leads to this uh, polyploidy to develop. Now on the la that video I talked about several different kinds of polyploidy. One of them was called autopolyploidy and the idea here is an organism that has say for example uh, three pairs of chromosomes, so that's six chromosomes total, uh, they do gametes and something wrong happened with the gametes and they do something called out of non-disjunction. So that will produce a diploid gamete and it's still a 2N gamete over there. But if this 2N gamete can successively mate with another 2N gamete, all right, then you're going to make a 4N organism that is going to be have 12 chromosomes. And this happens sometimes within the same plant because of self-fertilization. So the, type, the parent species makes an offspring that's polyploidy to the, to the original. And as long as this karyotype is viable and self-fertile, in other words, you can continue to make offspring out of that, that, you can consider that to become a different species. Another mechanism is called allopolyploidy. And there's two ways in which this can happen. Say, for example, you have a species that's 2N. And another species, by the way, notice that the first way only involves one species uh, making two separate uh, non-disjunction gametes and then combining them to make a new species. So this is when two members of the same species merge to become a new species. On these on the bottom here is called allopolyploidy. Remember, allo means other. That's when two different species are merging to become a new species. Okay, so this is or, uh, kind of fusion of two different species. So notice here you have a species A, which has uh, two pairs of chromosomes, so four chromosomes total, and species B has three pairs of chromosomes, so six chromosomes total. Now, of course, they probably can't really make successful offspring because they will have a nuclei if they try to match because the thing is that one has three on its, on its gamete and the other one has two. So when they actually try to match, they won't really have a gamete that matches. They will have this 
strange hybrid that doesn't really is not really viable because they're not going to have matched pairs the way it's supposed to be when you put two gametes together. So, but what happens if for some reason this undergoes mitosis, okay, and then non-disjunction happens at exactly the same time. So a polyploidy non-disjunction during mitosis, not during meiosis this time. So what it happens is that you make, of course, before mitosis, you make copies of the chromosomes. So now you have two chromatids for each one of these, but it's doubled. So, and that means this was a mitosis event. So you're going to get another cell here that gets absolutely no chromosomes. So that's no chromosomes up there. This cell got all of them. And then what happened there is that what used to be an unmatched hybrid became a diploid hybrid. Now, given, of course, that each of these copies will be identical to each other, but the point is you have matched chromosome pairs, and yet now you have a diploid number, except now the n number is 10, which is like combining each of the haploid numbers of the other two and then doubling it. So basically what's happening here is fusion of gametes, which are incompatible with each other, followed by mitosis with non-disjunction of all the chromosomes exactly the same time. Now, if this 2N species can then create gametes, which of course are going to be uh, half of them, so in this case, five chromosomes, and then still make fertile offspring, in other words, these gametes can actually fertilize each other to reestablish that 2N from which they came from, then you can consider this a new species that hybridized between the two of them. And this has been observed in nature many times, and we'll talk about that more when we do the evidence for macroevolution lecture later in this lecture series. And yet another kind of allopolypoid can actually happen when two species which are diploid each produce gametes which are, are going to be interesting. So the first one creates a normal gamete which is going to be halved, so that means a for example, in here you had six on the original, so now the normal gamete will have three. But on the second one, you did an unreduced gamete by non-disjunction polyploidy. So what happens is going to be just like the original. So this is actually a gamete. Look, it did something similar to what happened there on auto polyploidy. So this last kind here is like combining the first two that we talked about. So you have one species that did a normal gamete and another one that did not. And then for some reason, they actually form uh, a hybrid. Now, of course, since they're not matched, they're going to make what is called a, tri a triploid hybrid, where some of the chromosomes are going to be matched, but some are not going to be matched. So, of course, this is not really working out because it's got a nuclear, it's got all weird kind of things. This is not going to survive. But what if this, for some reason, does do a gamete, and then you have this same thing unreduced again, so a second uh, polyploidy event during meiosis. So not just one, but two polyploidy events during meiosis, and you're going to have this unreduced gamete again. By the way, how, why are these plants doing this kind of stuff? Why are they making so many defective gametes? Well, it could be for a lot of different reasons, but, but remember, plants actually evolve in this way, so there's actually mechanisms that sometimes facilitate the process of non-disjunction taking place. You know, It could be also because of mutations or radiation exposure of all kinds of different things. But either way, now, if this second unreduced gamete, which it came from this, 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 this tr the tripoid hybrid, crosses again with another gamete from the second species, now you're going to get the three which are unpaired again to it, and now you're going to make a completed genome where you have a 2N with a total of 10 uh, chromosomes. So basically, what you did here is you got this, and you, and you kept it, so you're basically rising, raising the number, but then you added three more chromosomes for a total of seven, but that was not viable, but either way, you still anyways did polyploidy with meiosis again, so you still have seven total, but it's, it's kind of triploid, it's not matched correctly, and the pairs are not exactly matched, but then you put three more from the other one, and then you match them, and so now you have a total of ten chromosomes um, where they're all paired together, so there's five pairs of matched chromosomes. So this is, again, an example of polyploidy. So in either of the examples, you're going to have failure of for during the cell division leading to formation of new species. In one example, you have the same species forming a gamete that is polyploidy through meiosis, and then if two of those gametes actually meet, and they can actually form a 4N cell, which can then create gametes which can restore the 4N, you can call that a different species. Or... There's also processes which involve the crossing 
of two separate species. And this one here, you see the allopolyploidy that we talk about in the second time with two successive fertilizations between two different species and two successive polyploidy events through meiosis. There's also the allopolyploidy that involves uh, mitosis, non-disjunction that we talked about before. Either one of these will call, cause this to happen. See, this is the second example that we talked about. The merging of two different species to form a hybrid that is now polyploid. You know, so this has actually been observed in nature. This, these two types of flowers are completely different kinds of flowers. They, they, are, they shouldn't actually be able to make offspring with each other. And they, but they do. And they make this, which is clearly not the same thing as that. Because you see, if you try to cross this, this hybrid plant with the parent plant, it will be unable to have offspring. So that means it can't, uh, they're different species. But this plant can actually cross with itself, which means it's going to be a different species. So, and it's viable, you know? So that means this has actually been observed in nature over the last uh, few, few hundred years. So you can actually see this actually taking place in nature today. It has been replicated in the lab as well. They figured out, I wonder where this plant comes from. And we actually call it uh, mirus because it's mirroring both of the other uh, two types of flowers. But what we did is that we wondered if there was any relationship between that one and that one or that one. So we were wondering if they were related somehow. And then what we did is that we tried to do this hybridization and in the lab and lo and behold the product was exactly what you found in nature in other words that means that in nature this happened to create this this flower and they got hybridized and that my friend is an example of macroevolution actually taking place other examples if you want to see uh, animal macroevolution include this example of a very cool uh, fly this is a maggot fly that lives in apples in europe now, the cool thing is that this maggot fly is used to a certain kind of apple, but because the, the farmers imported an apple from somewhere else, they were not able to really d d deal with that new kind of apple. Now, some of the maggot flies actually did uh, evolve to actually go to that apple and actually explore that niche of that new kind of apple that was introduced into their ecosystem. While other maggot flies did not have the mutations necessary to actually prefer that apple. But after many, many generations of actually differentiating which apple they were growing on and choosing, they actually developed into different kinds of flies. The flies that stuck to the original apple became one species, and the flies that stuck to the new kind of apple became a different species, and now the two strands cannot cross with each other, or at least not cross uh, successively enough that over a few generations they will still survive. So that means what's happening there is hybrid breakdown, uh, the last type of isolation you can possibly get. So effectively what we did in the last hundred years since the introduction of this new kind of apple imported from, from Asia into the European uh, farms is that you make the, the maggot fly uh, evolve into a separate niche within its own population and as a consequence you're going to have behavioral um, differentiation between isolation between the two species which ultimately led to um, a niche separation which then ultimately led to speciation or separate mutations between the two species since most of the breeding occurred within that those pop the, the population that was choosing that apple so that's pretty cool and we actually saw this happen so if you need an example of animal macroevolution there you go evolution of the maggot fly observed in the last hundred years because of the introduction of a new uh, niche for them within the ecosystem so i've seen the st patrick because they explored a new niche within the same population they still had access to the original flies it's just that they preferred mating with the flies that were focusing on the same kind of apple and so that led to its differentiation between the species another example is lake victoria's uh cyclids diversity different types of fish which are all come from the same family all come because of of separation that existed in niche between them they live in different parts of the lake they have different types of mating behavior and eventually they all develop different set of colorations and even anatomical structures all because they were exploring different niches this is because they were choosing to mate with uh, up with the types of fish that look like them which live nearby them and so forth but they were all in the same lake it's just that they they set in their own kind of like niche their own kind of habitat 
So this would, of course, be an example of sexual selection because of the differences in, in the coloration pattern, because of the differences in the behavior, it led to differences between the species. I also did another example, if you remember, about wobblers. They live in the same tree. They don't have geographical separation, but because they have different niches within the same population, they led to differentiation between the species. The same thing here you see in the diversity of the cyclids. So this is, again, an example of sympatric speciation taking place in nature. So as you can see, speciation can happen with physical separation or without. And in our next video, we review these concepts and talk about some other kinds of advanced speciation processes. We'll see you guys there.